dream Something inside is always yearning Yearning for a brand new world People everywhere are so confused Leaders don't know just what to do How they want a brand new world Though we send rockets to the moon and the stars
of this beautiful world that we live in. And may I just say to you, welcome to this hour of worship. Thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate your contributions, your support, your prayers. As a matter of fact, let's ask the presence of the Lord to come and take over this time, this morning. Will you pray with us? Father of all creation, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Thank you that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. There never was, never will be any who compares to you. For all the gods of the earth are idols, but you made the world and all that there is in it. And so we come to bow in your presence to worship you and to celebrate you. But we ask, oh God, that you would clean our hands, purify our hearts, make us clean through the blood of Jesus the Christ so that we can truly worship you the way we ought to. That is in spirit and in truth. So now, Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and tabernacle amongst your people wherever we are this, this morning, this moment, this time, this hour. We ask your blessing on us. And Lord, we thank you for all those who support this ministry in their prayers, their gifts, their offering. And so we lift our offering, our gifts, our tithes, along with those that are sent to the work here at the city that incorporated. And we ask you to continue to bless the efforts of our hands. Bless us with abundant blessing that go beyond the material things such as money, house, land, or car. Bless us so that we can continue to be a blessing to those around us. We give you thanks and we give you praise right now. In the name of Jesus, the one who is the Christ, the one who was and is to come. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen, Amen. We're going to go straight into the world this morning. And we ask you that you follow along with us. This is the fifth in the dream series, last night we had a visiting guest, my niece, Pastor Marlette Pottinger, or from Jamaica, and what a powerful message that was. If you missed last week, we do invite you, because it flowed in the series, the dream series. Today, we want to start with a phrase. Knowing what you need to know, this is what we focus on this message in the dream series and I'm not going to be preaching at you we're going to share the word this morning and I want to relate a dream to you that occurred in the third year of Belshazzar's reign a young man had a vision after that one that he had before so this would have been his second vision. And I want you to see him as he, the vision appeared. In it he saw himself in the city of Susa, the citadel there, in the province of India. And in the vision he was beside the Uliye Canal. And may I just say here at the start that Uliye was the Hebrew name for a river near the city of Susa. To the Greeks, it was known as Elios. But this young man, he looked up and in that vision, right there before him was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal. Now, one of the horns was longer than the other, but it grew up later. He watched the ram as it charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against this long-horned ram and none could rescue from its power. It simply did as it pleased and this long-horned ram became great. So in the dream, this young man, and by now, you know I'm talking about Daniel. And in this dream in Daniel chapter 8, 
as Daniel was thinking about this dangerous realm, suddenly a goat with prominent horn between its eyes came from the west. One horn. And crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. This is a dream. This goat came forward towards the two horned ram. He had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it with great rage. Daniel saw this ram. He saw the goat attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. Mm. The ram was powerless to stand against this goat, which knocked it to the ground and trampled on it. And none could rescue the ram from the power of the goat. The goat became great, but at the height of its power, the long horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up towards the four wings of heaven. A strange dream it is happening, and Daniel is in this dream. He's seen. Now, out of one of these four horns, something strange happened. Another horn came out. It started to grow, but it grew with power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the hosts of heaven and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on it. Strange dream, isn't it? It set itself up. This new horn that came out of the four. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord and his sanctuary was thrown down. Now can you imagine that? Now because of the rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifices were given over to this horn, this new creature. It prospered in everything it did. And the truth was thrown to the ground. Strange. It's a dream. Then Daniel heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice. The rebellion that causes desolation. The surrender of the sanctuary and the trampling on the foot of the Lord's people. How long? He said to Daniel, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. By now you know I'm giving you a rendition, my rendition. Of the first 14 verses of Daniel chapter 8. It is important for you to bear in mind, as I said before, knowing what you need to know. This is very important. And we are in the dream series. And notice all the details that I just related. Can you imagine somebody in a dream? And remembering all of that. And that is why at the start of the series, one of the instructions we got was to write the dream, record it as soon as you can, so you don't forget it. Very important to write your dream. Now, if you're casually associated with the scripture, you will know that this dream just related has been fulfilled except for one portion which pertains to the distant future. But stay with me, can you visualize yourself in a dream such as this? Have you ever had a dream? Can you imagine even a more compelling dream in which you are 
not only seeing it, but you are a part of it. This is what Daniel was experiencing in chapter 8. He was not only observing, but he was a participant in the dream. This dream or vision is one of those encounters that you cannot easily forget. It's not one that you can forget as soon as you wake up. No, no. Talking about dreams, I've been having a number of dreams since I started the dream series and I haven't related any of them to you. But let me tell you this. The very day when we did the introduction to this dream series, it looked like we got the devil upset and I'm glad we did. Because that very night, I had a dream. And in that dream, I dreamt that I went to a house, a fairly big house. And I've been a teacher for those of you who know me. I went there, it seemed to teach a youngster, a little boy, and he seemed to have had some problems. He seemed to have been neglected in the house. So I taught him and I related to him, encouraged him. And then his mother came in and said she had to leave for some function, but the little boy's father was to come for him shortly. So I encouraged the little boy, gave him positive words, and then his father came. I didn't see the father, but the father came in a hurry. Say, son, hurry, we've got to go. And this little boy was getting dressed, but something went wrong with one of his favorite pieces of garment, his pants, the zipper. Something went wrong with it. I fixed it for the little boy, because I saw that he wanted to wear that pair of pants. And he came to me and he hugged me. He said, thank you, you're a good man. And he left. As soon as he left the house with his father, the place took on a different scenario. One that obviously intended to scare yours truly. It's as if all kinds of strange creep human beings turned up in that house and I could tell immediately that these were not servants of the Most High. They were representatives of the devil. And the Spirit of the Lord arose in me in my dream. And all of a sudden, I found myself walking around this big house, rebuking all these spirits. At one point, I found myself with a pair of scissors in my hand, just rebuking them in the name of Jesus, casting them out of the house. And then when it seemed as if things settled down, an angel appeared in the form of my mother. And she said with that pleasant voice, it's okay, Floyd, it's okay. You can leave now. And I was getting ready. I walked out on the balcony to pick up something. And one of the demons came back in sea as if to try to hurl me over. And I rebuked it again in the name of Jesus Christ. I woke up to ask the Lord what was happening. And then I heard the answer. He was upset. He's still upset with all of these messages pertaining to dreams. You see, because dreams can be confusing, as we said earlier on, but when you have the power and the presence of the Lord in you, I'm getting ahead of myself. Dreams are important. Real dreams when God speaks to us. Dreams. I won't tell you all the dreams because I've been writing them down, but compare that dream that I just related to another dream that I had just two nights ago. This one, more pleasant. And strange enough, again, I went to a house, it seems, to teach a young student some music. Beautiful family it was. And after that, they assigned me a room. When I was finished, we sat down for a meal, very pleasant family. And then I was getting ready to go because I got the impression as well that they had a function to go to and my time there was supposed to be over. So I was about to go back to my room to pick up my equipment and leave when suddenly there was a flip. 
the scene changed my God to a most beautiful scenario I was no longer in a house but after that pleasant meal and I agreed to leave, the place suddenly was transformed into the most beautiful and spectacular palace with hundreds of people dressed in elegant, radiant attire as if awaiting a super special guest. But despite my best effort, I'm telling you at this moment, I could not find the simple room with my belongings. I ended up walking around the palace huge mansions for what seemed like hours and while I was walking around touring many of the people present, present they smiled at me and called me by name as if I were a major shareholder or a commander at high level of authority and respect at this location this huge location at one point I even opened the door to a large banquet hall with crystal chandeliers but quickly closed it since I was searching for that small room with my stuff in it. I searched and walked the halls and rooms with people posing for photographs of various parts of the palace grounds. The color scheme for the ladies was primarily lime green and yellow harmonizing with, with autumn colors. It was an awesome, beautiful dream but I still could not find that simple room with my things. I kept searching until I awoke from that dream. And I asked the Lord, I've been asking the Lord the meaning of that dream. It has more meanings, not only for me, but I dare say to somebody who is listening right now. And what it said to me personally is this. It said, son, don't go looking for a small room. Don't think small anymore. You are a child of a king. You are royalty. Stop thinking of small room. Think of a palace. Think of a mansion. Think of big, awesome, wonderful, beautiful things. I encourage you to take that part of this dream if you've been thinking small and start thinking big but let me get back to Daniel chapter 8 in this dream series because in this vision Daniel <laughs> someone knew the agony of the bewilderment that he was experiencing and offered some clarification let me tell you something God will always let you know what you need to know. Need I repeat that? I said Yahweh, the Almighty, will always let you know what you need to know. So while Daniel was in this vision, but at the same time watching the vision and trying to understand it, if you look from verse 15 through to the end of Daniel chapter 8, right there before him stood one who looked like a man. And Daniel heard a man's voice from the Uliai calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. I tell you, God will always let you know what you need to know. So as he came near to the place where Daniel was standing, Daniel was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to Daniel, understand the vision concerns the end. You need to understand it concerns the end. Hmm. While Gabriel was speaking to him, Daniel was in a deep sleep. I said he was seeing the vision and experiencing the vision. How awesome can that be? So he was in a deep sleep with his face to the ground. Then Gabriel touched him and raised him to his feet. Have you ever been touched by an angel? Can you imagine being touched by an angel of God? How awesome that can be. I have had experiences, I can't go into those this morning, but angel touched Gabriel. Gabriel touched Daniel 
and raise him to his feet. I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, said Gabriel, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two horn ram that you saw represent the kings of Media and Persia. You see, dreams can be confusing unless there is no clarification. So Gabriel continues. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. Gabriel continues to talk. In the latter part of their reign, the four kings, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue will arise. Let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. Wicked, a fierce looking king, master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. Remember this. Strong, wicked, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will, and will succeed in whatever he does. I want you to remember this. He will be strong and powerful, but not in his own power. He will be successful in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper. And he will consider himself superior when they feel secure. He will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. He will try to take his stand against the capital prince of princes. Yet, he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Mm. It tells us by the time you get to the last two verses that the vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you, says Gabriel, is true. But well, watch this. Seal the vision. For it concerns the distant future. Seal the vision because it concerns the distant future. By the time you get to the last verse of that eighth chapter of Daniel, that verse 27 tells us that Daniel was worn out and lay exhausted for several days. Then he got up and went about the king's business. He was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Even though, because you have to remember that this was going to take place hundreds of years after his time. But God will always let you know what you need to know. Let me pause and say something right here. No matter how drained you are after a spiritual encounter such as a dream or a visitation, do not use it to avoid your duties, to avoid your responsibilities. I don't have time to go into all of the meanings of this vision. But I did mention that it has already come to pass, except for the parallel meaning. Note that in this vision, Daniel was still in it. But he saw himself on the shore of the Persian River. He heard Gabriel giving the instruction, an explanation, an assurance that the vision had to do with what? The end times. Latter times. Now for some of us it may pose a problem because I did say it happened already. To get an idea of what I mean, you might have to go and read some things that are not in this book. 
you'll have to go and read some secular history. This is not a theological seminary class, so I'm not going to go into depth into that. But I'll tell you a few things. This prophecy literally was fulfilled in the days of the Middle Persian and Greek empires, especially in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Yes. So the end time for that time has passed. But there's a parallel in time, in time, and it mustn't be confused. That reference to the eschaton, the return, the second coming of the Christ. So although this prophecy was fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes, it also has this lack of fulfillment in the Antichrist, referring to the end time. Antiochus Epiphanes prefigures the Antichrist of the end time. He is sometimes called, this Antiochus is sometimes called the Antichrist of the Old Testament. So just as he rose in power with force and intrigue, so will the Antichrist of, let me say, our time. He persecuted the Jews in his time. He stopped sacrifice and desecrated the temple. The Antichrist is going to do the same in our time. And you will seem to be a complete success when you read the secular history. When you read Maccabees. But based on what Antiochus did to the Jews in his day, one may be able to perceive with confidence that the Antichrist will do the same towards the end time. Not preaching at you, just slowly going. The Antico, the Anti, the Antiochus, Epiphanes, was a product of Greece with all its refinement, culture, and arts. The Old Testament Anti Antichrist. Yes, Antiochus. Can we not reasonably argue today that so many of the so-called Christian nations may be sponsoring the New Testament Antichrist because we are compromising the gospel, worshiping men instead of giving credence supreme to the King of Kings? Let me tell you that the Antichrist of the Old Testament <laughs> was dangerous and it gives us an idea of what we can expect for the face to Antichrist. I am not going to give you all the details, but let me just tell you some things that you won't find in the Bible explicitly because you can't write everything in it. But what is written in it is more than enough to tell you that God is supreme. Remember I told you about the Lord, the large horn between the eyes that, that, goat, that was the first king. This was fulfilled in the history when you look at Alexander the Great. The four kings, that section was fulfilled when you look at what happened after Alexander the Great passed and his domain was split up between his four generals. So that has already happened. We talk about the rise and fall of the strong arm. The strong arm, this prophecy reads equally in both that time intertestamental time old testament and the new time this is an example of a prophetic passage that has both a near and a far meaning the near meaning is what you know happened history has proven that these empires and kingdoms have come and gone but there's another antichrist let me preach to myself because somebody's going to hear and listen my wife and I have been talking quite a bit based on what we see happening around us about the end times. But if you and I are to survive and stay faithful to the King of Kings, mm, there are some things that we need to understand and remember. So let me tell you some things about this Antiochus Epiphanes. He was known for his cruelty, his brutality. 
some have said that he is responsible for the death of as many as a hundred thousand Jews in his time. See this as a picture of what could be true at the coming of the parallel Antichrist. Desecration of temple and places of worship. The Antichrist will be responsible for the death of thousands of Christ's followers. Mm. <laughs> this Antiochus was known for flattery and smooth the tongue. The Antichrist that will come will strike a covenant with God's people. So you have to be careful. He will be so smooth. And let me just pick something from the next chapter of Daniel, verse 27 of chapter 9. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. This Antiochus was empowered by Satan, but God was allowing him to run to the end of his rope. The saying is true of the coming Antichrist. This Antichrist of the Old Testament presented a picture of total success. The coming Antichrist will look like a complete winner until God topples his reign. So it's not every success is success, but only God can give you the power to discern. Watch this now. Both the rule of Antiochus Epiphanes in the past and the Antichrist of the dead future, which I declare is not or soon to be, is marked by deceit. Deceit, a dangerous trait of the Antichrist. Deceit will cause the person with charisma to convince you that what you are seeing is not it. You will look out and they will tell you that the sun that you see shining in the day is not the sun, it is the moon. And they will be so convincing that you will believe. Do you know any leaders like that today? Do you know any politicians like that today? 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10 tells me that the coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan. With all power, signs and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So if they don't stand for anything, they will fall for anything. If they don't know God's word and practice a relationship with him, they will fall. The Antichrist, let me tell you something, shall exalt himself. I need to tell you something, that in Antiochus' day, the coin that was created in his name had a certain inscription. The inscription on it read Theos Epiphanes, which meant God manifest. The Antichrist will seek to set himself up as God in the temple of God, in the place of worship of God. I have to remind you what 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 says. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And he was the Old Testament Antichrist hated the people of God and fought against them, showing that it was because he is what? The real hate of God. His actions, though perpetrated against God's people, God's people was saying, revealing that he hated God. The same will be true of the Antichrist in the latter day. He will hate God's people simply because he hates God. But hallelujah, praise the Lord. 
the Antichrist of the Old Testament, the Antiochus, the Epiphanes. <laughs> History has told us they are fallen. History tells us that this Antiochus of the Old Testament died of disease, not by the hand of a human being. Similarly, no man will defeat the coming Antichrist, but the hand of God will bring about his demise. I said the hand of God will bring about his demise. Daniel, hmm. I have to let you know that when you read the book of Daniel, even this chapter, you cannot help but think of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelations. Let me borrow a verse right here. You see in this vision, Daniel was instructed to steal the thing, put it away. It wasn't for his time. But look what happens in Revelation 19, verse 20. But the beast was captured, and within the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf, with these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of sulfur. But in Revelation, it's going to be open. Daniel must seal up the vision because it is in another time. Revelation 22 verse 10 tells me this. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this school because the time is near. So Daniel was told to close it. It wasn't that time. But in the latter time, it's going to be open. So before I close this morning, there are some principles and warning signs for us in this chapter. The dream in Daniel's time, in chapter 8, is primarily about the rise and fall of the so-called great empires of the past. But remember this. And let me quote the Bible so you don't think it's my opinion. Remember this. Let me just borrow something that is from Daniel chapter 2 verse 21. It is Yahweh the Almighty who changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and even more knowledge to those who have understanding. Daniel 2 21. When God gives you a dream, when God gives you a vision, He wants to let you know what you need to know. If it is not immediately clear to you, He will provide an explanation of what you need to know like Gabriel was sent to do in Daniel's time. Yes, when you get a dream or a vision, the dream may be one of correction or warning. The dream, the vision may be one of consolation. The dream may be a short-term prediction or a long-term prophecy. Sometimes the dream, the vision, the visitation is not for your time but for a distant period. So let me remind you again write it down. Some people like to give the impression that they understand and can explain every dream right away all the time. But they cannot do so unless God gives them that particular gift. In. Jehovah the Almighty will always allow you, he will always allow me to know what we need to know. Just ask him. As a matter of fact, sometimes you don't have to ask him because he knows that it is so per perplexing. He can read your thoughts, your heart, your mind, your spirit. And he will just say, send a Gabriel to explain this dream. Pray that prayer when you have a dream that you cannot understand. Say, Lord, send a Gabriel to explain this thing. Let me understand. So here, before I close, is a warning for the so-called nations and rulers of our time of today. You can either be pro-Christ, for Christ, or anti-Christ, against Christ. Be careful 
of your choice. This goes not only for leaders, but it goes for subjects or followers or people like you and I. Choosing this day whom he will serve. This dream see series has warning for you and for me. Look around at what is happening in the world. I cannot help but think that the Antichrist is already here and is only becoming more prominent and more manifested. Look at warning signs on the internet. Look at warning signs over the airwaves. Look at warning signs with occurrences in various parts of the world. Look at warning signs even with the changing of the weather from extreme to extreme. When it's not extreme heat, it's extreme cold. When it's not extreme cold, it's a flood, it's famine, it's fire. The wickedness of men seems to grow worse and worse. Men have spent the majority of the day designing the most dangerous weapons of mass destruction, threatening to use them at any time, at any moment something could happen. I cannot lie to you and tell you that is going to happen tomorrow. I don't know, but I can tell you this. With what is happening on the internet and the easily availability of the gospel of Christ to all and sundry, pretty soon no one will have an excuse that they didn't hear the warning. Don't see the dreams that you get. Don't seal the message that you're getting today. Open your heart, your thoughts, your minds and soul. Start if you haven't done so by accepting this Jesus the Christ. Ask him to fortify you, to strengthen you, so that when you get your visitations and your dreams, you'll be sure to get clarification. Ask him into your heart if you have not yet known him. Say, Lord, come into my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit, my entire being. I accept you as Lord, I renounce Satan and all that the Antichrist stands for. Jesus, I'm giving myself to you voluntarily now. And if you say you are Christ for our kingdom, citizen or witness of the gospel of Christ, uh, let us start living. Let's go deeper and deeper into the world and don't discard the visitations that God has given you. I'm not saying he only speaks to you in dreams and visions, but the Bible tells me that in the last days, He's going to pour out of his spirit on all flesh. The young men will dream dreams and the old men will have visions. Mark my word and be ready. Do that today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, which is from everlasting to everlasting. Your word and this word that though written so many thousands of years ago, it's as relevant because it has layers and layers of revelation. So, Lord, we give our hearts, our souls, our minds, our spirits to you. And we ask, oh God, that when we go to bed each night, we will, we'll give ourselves to you before we go to sleep so that you can access our entire being and reveal your will to us. Now, Lord, make your people strong in these days so that no weapon will succeed against us. Let us be the remnant of those who wait for your, your return, but not idly, but represent your gospel. We give you thanks. And Lord, for those who accept your word and this message this morning, I speak a special deliverance, a special revelation, a special anointing. If you are sick this morning, I declare the healing of Christ, the eternal one, into your body right now. If you are in a state of confusion, I speak peace and healing to your mind this morning. If you want direction, I speak clarification and, and revelation to you this morning. Will you dare to believe? Join me and believe. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you deep insight and divine revelation with clarification, covered with his protection. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen.